So this morning we are in Exodus chapter 18. Probably just 18. We'll see. I'll go ahead and read it. And Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back, with her two sons, of whom the name of one was Gershom, for he said, I have been a stranger in a foreign land. And the name of the other was Eliezer, for he said, The God of my father was my help, and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness, where he was encamped at the mountain of God. Now he had said to Moses, I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons with her. So Moses went out to meet his father-in-law, bowed down and kissed him. And they asked each other about their well-being, and they went into the tent. And Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardship that had come upon them on the way, and how the Lord had delivered them. Then Jethro rejoiced for all the good which the Lord had done for Israel, whom he had delivered out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord, who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh, and who has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods. From the very thing in which they behaved proudly, he was above them. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took a burnt offering and other sacrifices to offer to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. And so it was on the next day that Moses sat to judge the people. And the people stood before Moses from morning until evening. So when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did for the people, he said, What is this thing that you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit and all the people stand before you from morning until evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a difficulty, they come to me, and I judge between one and another, and I make known the statutes of God and his laws. So Moses' father-in-law said to him, The thing that you do is not good. Both you and these people who are with you will surely wear yourselves out. For this thing is too much for you. You are not able to perform it by yourself. Listen now to my voice. I will give you counsel, and God will be with you. Stand before God for the people, so that you may bring the difficulties to God. And you shall teach them the statutes and the laws, and show them the way in which they must walk and the work they must do. Moreover, you shall select from all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of ten. And let them judge the people at all times. Then it will be that every great matter they shall bring to you, but every small matter they themselves shall judge. So it will be easier for you, for they will bear the burden with you. If you do this thing, and God so commands you, then you will be able to endure, and all this people will also go to their place in peace. So Moses heeded the voice of his father-in-law, and did all that he had said. And Moses chose able men out of all Israel, and made them heads over the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. So they judged the people at all times, the hard cases they brought to Moses, but they judged every small case themselves. Then Moses let his father-in-law depart, and he went his way to his own land. And we don't know, obviously, at what point uh, Moses had sent his wife and children back. We certainly had them coming with him when he left Midian originally. Remember at the point they were on the way and the Lord came to kill Moses. And his wife recognized what was going on and circumcised their son. And that saved Moses' life. Some point after that, he sent his wife and his children back to Midian to stay with his father-in-law. Uh, obviously not for forever, as Jethro now brings them back to him. And as a particular point, because the, the things that go on in this chapter, particularly with how he deals with the people, they don't just apply to Moses and how he dealt with all the people. He had to model that first in his own family, and how he would deal with his wife and with his children and then apply that to the rest of the nation 
as an example. I mean, it, it says he's supposed to show them um, what they must do and the work they must do, how they would do those things. And having his own family there was kind of a prerequisite for showing them how that model would continue to progress as it went down to the rest of the people. But when did uh, Moses's, when did Moses' father-in-law, wasn't he, I don't, I don't remember him being a priest or worshiping God, I guess he, he was, he was the priest of Midian. Uh, let's see, back here so in... Is that a godly priest, or has he now changed his thought after what he's seen and heard in... Well, that's an interesting thing, because I'm, I'm pretty sure when it talks about him before, it just talks about him being the priest. Uh, he's just the priest of Midian. It doesn't particularly say whether he was a priest of Jehovah or not. He was the priest for them serving God. I believe he was a, a descendant of Ishmael, so technically he was a proto-Muslim. So, um, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, he was a priest, but it doesn't say he was worshiping God until now, mm-hmm. which is interesting. Right. But we certainly get a sense of what he then says to Moses. Was he wanting to worship God, like the true God? Whether he knew his name or not, was that his desire, do you think? Well, he's seen what all God's done. Whether he's choosing to worship him or not, he realizes who he is now. Mm -hmm. Because he offers a sacrifice to him and wants to be on the right side of all the destruction he's seen. I mean, now it's a pretty definitive line of what's happened to people that were not following God. So it's pretty obvious, yeah. It, it but there's hard. still people on the other side that right. don't worship God. I think it really points towards Jethro as, as the priest of Midian, that he was uh, desiring and working hard to worship the true God. Perhaps he didn't know him as well as he knows him now, through all the evidence of what's gone on in Israel and in Egypt. But that his desire was to do that. And he says, now I know the Lord is the God of all gods, that Jehovah uses that capital Lord that, that means they use that he, Jehovah he name. He know how to manage people, or he, ha- he knows a way of... He's been a priest for decades. <laughs> yeah, so he, he knows the authority part of how to delegate this mm-hmm. so to speak. Mm-hmm. And so the Lord sent him here, if nothing else, is to show Moses that you gotta, you'd be able to set this up, which he talks about in 20. He is a, like the key of the, the whole thing is Teach the people these statutes. You know, go make disciples out of them, basically. So just keep doing all the, making all the decisions for them. Yeah. Teach them how to do that on their own. Yeah. And that you know whatever role uh, Jethro had, if we looked at it kind of terrestrially, the position that Moses was in at this time would probably rate higher than whatever position Jethro was in. Jethro was a priest, a minion. Here's Moses, the mouthpiece of God. He like literally talks to God every day <laughs> and his father-in-law comes back with his family to visit him well, Moses is a pretty important guy at this point he's leading millions of people across the wilderness they're being fed directly by God every single day and Moses is the one talking to him and, and finding out the things that they ought to do and that d- despite that elevation and the position that God had put him in, Moses still shows honor to Jethro, who comes. And in, as we're talking, we're recognizing we don't know how well Jethro knew Jehovah as the Lord. You know, he worshipped God in what capacity or sense he knew him, we don't know. And Moses doesn't look down on him for what he may not have known or understood before, but still honors him when he shows up he goes out and he meets him and he bows down and kisses him gives him all the regular uh, pleasantries that uh, people would as they meet someone else and he honors him as a guest. Uh, and, and no matter how elevated God has made us, being, being proud and being haughty over other people is not a character trait that the Lord is going to give to us. And Jethro had, as you mentioned, heard of what the Lord had done and that was probably a a good part he could have sent uh, Moses' wife and children with someone else but Jethro himself wanted to come and and talk to Moses because he'd heard about what the Lord had done and could I get a couple people to look up verses three different people Tom okay can you look up Psalm 105 1 through 5 verses 1 through 5 Psalm 111 2 through 4 
and Psalm 145, 10 through 12. So Psalm 105. Verses 1 through 5. 1 through 5. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing psalms to him. Talk of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his face evermore. Remember his marvelous works which he has done. His wonders and the judgments of his mouth. And 111.2-4 The works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have pleasure in them. His work is honorable and glorious, and his righteousness endures forever. He has made his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. And 145.10-12 All your works shall praise you. O oh, Yehovah, and your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. There's a certain sense of, of wonder that we have as we come to recognize not just who God is, but what he does day by day even. And certainly the Israelites with what they had seen that as they desired to worship God, one of the, the ways that they worshipped was talking about the things that God had done. And, I mean, this had spread. It's been maybe three months since the, the Israelites have left Egypt at this point. That word has already spread all the way across to Midian, but farther than they have gone yet. So it wasn't them that brought the word. Other people are hearing about this stuff that's going on. And Jesse had heard about it, and not just as a whole bunch of natural disasters came and you know crippled the Egyptian economy and their military, but that the Lord, Yehovah, had done these things. As we see here in Psalms, where it's written over and over again, that his saints will bless his name by talking about the things that God has done, who speak about his glory, about his power, about his kingdom, about the, the wondrous acts that he does, uh, that we see, I mean, things that happen all the time. You know, in, in 105, it says, sing to him, psalm, sing psalms to him, and talk of all his wondrous works. It doesn't mean just in Sunday morning in church, you know, with our songs, but as we go through life, we're telling people about <laughs> these amazing things that God is doing. Well, they had to have seen part of it as well. Because when you look back in chapter 10, in 14 and 15, and when it talks about the locusts, that went up and over the land of Egypt, but in 15 it says, for they covered the face of the whole earth. So they had to have, if they're over in Midian, had to have seen those locusts as well, because mm -hmm. it covered the whole earth. Yeah. So they you saw some of those. People saw these right? things, for yeah. sure. But uh, we and just had, here. we had just last month, we had a big event that God caused. It was the eclipse. I mean, people saw that far and wide, you know, hundreds of miles wide, and the there's a big deal. People were talking about it. What was the overriding sense of what it was, or what it meant in the world? It was just a thing that happened, and it was a cosmic event, and it signified rebirth, and new life, and all these things. Mostly it was not. It signifies the power of God, and it's a witness to who He is and what He can do. People will tend to take something even as crazy as locusts covering the whole earth and just say, wow, that was a crazy natural thing that happened and man, how the cycles and the weather and darn yeah, locusts kill, the, kill all of it. It has to be people who know about God who will then talk to people and be like, no, that wasn't just, it didn't just happen. Circumstance pop out of nowhere. God did this for a reason. And that those who love God and, and that will be compelled to be a witness for God and interpret those things for other people. Like, <laughs> here's who did that. Here's Jehovah. And that, that word had been spreading across the world. Who had done these things? And that Jethro had heard that. And his desire was to inform himself more fully of the things that God had done. He wanted to know. And that again will be a hallmark of God's people is when they hear about something that God 
has done or that God is doing, they'll be interested in it. They'll want to find out more about that. Not just, well, okay, well, that's, that's interesting. Good for them. He travels. We don't know how far he traveled, but he took time out from being his priest in his area to go over here and find out from Moses. They sat and they talked. And Moses told him more detail than he would have gotten from anyone else. Sure. Uh, all the things that had happened and what God had done and why he had done them to rescue his own people. And despite Jethro not being one who would, would benefit from what God had done, he didn't rescue Jethro's people and promise Jethro's people a land of milk and honey and stuff that they hadn't worked for and cities that they didn't build. Jethro really didn't get anything out of this. He, he lost his son-in-law, who was taking care of his flocks, and his daughter and their, his grandkids. Um, but he was still glad and he still praised the Lord for the things that he had done. Uh, and, and saw that more as recognition of who the Lord was. That, that capital Lord that's in there that, that signifies Jehovah. You know, in verse 11, now I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods. No matter what else he may or may not have been worshipping back in Midian or allowing other people to worship. I don't think he would allow them to continue that uh, in light of what he now knew. And uh, the rest of that verse, for in the very thing in which they behaved proudly, he was above them. That was part of the evidence to Jethro that God was the God above anything else that might call itself a God was it in the things that, particularly the Egyptians, had a number of gods for different <coughs> things. You know, this god is the god of the sun. He's in control of the sun. This is the god of the river Nile. and He's in control of the river Nile. Here's the god of the weather. Here's the god of the animals. And when we saw in all those plagues that God brought that he continued to usurp whatever power they may have thought they had, even of the magicians themselves and the pride that they had in their magics. Look, we can make snakes! Well, so can God, and then his can eat yours. It was just, it was better than anything that they could do. The very things they were proud in, he proved himself to be greater. And that God tends to do that uh, as evidence for his people. He will take the pride that others have and show that he is greater than that. If they didn't have the pride, he wouldn't be showing. But because they do, he takes that opportunity and goes, okay. There you go. Uh, well, in First Peter, he says that God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. The more proud somebody is, the more you're going to find that God is actually against them. And then Jethro further honors God by offering sacrifices, uh, which they hadn't. God hadn't yet set up the priesthood and the way that they would do sacrifices uh, for Israel yet, where. Aaron and his brethren and his sons would be the priests doing all the sacrificing for the rest of the people. And I'm certain that Jethro was accustomed to doing this sort of thing back in Midian. He was the priest there. And so it wasn't strange that he would be offering uh, offerings and sacrifices to God. Uh, but there, it's, a, it's a picture to me of how they're all joining in praise. After meeting and discussing the things that God had done and rejoicing together in them, they're continuing to rejoice in their sacrifices together. You know, they haven't seen each other in quite a while. Once they do come together, they rejoice in all the great things that the Lord has done for, for one side at this point. It wasn't, oh, they both shared awesome things that happened and rejoiced in both of them. It was all about the one side. And he wasn't above uh, himself, Jethro, wasn't above sacrificing for the good God had done for someone else. So again, this didn't really impact Jethro at all. Material. He didn't gain anything from what God had done to the Israelites. And yet he's willing to sacrifice for the good and the <clears throat> blessings that God has given to other people. And that helps bring us closer together when we do that. When we recognize the blessing God has given to someone else and we all rejoice together in that. But I, I do, I mean, if you have a godly nation worshiping God set up camp next to you, or you're aligned with them, it will bless you. You know, you will reap the benefits of that. So it's, um, 
You can't say he didn't get anything, any benefit out of it. I mean, we don't know of any benefit he got. Except yeah. that we could surmise they did. Right. I mean, if you get somebody that's a godly person living next door to you, and they're serving God and God's blessing them, you don't have to worry about that. So even just the peace that comes from that, you receive, you know, something mm-hmm. good there, or you know, you've got a shelter to run to. Regardless of what you're doing over here, that's always there. But if you have enemies on both sides of you, camped, you know, there's no peace. You never know what's going to happen. So mm-hmm. there is some benefit to acknowledging, you know, God is taking care of you, and he, I know He's God, and He's your leader, and, and I'm secure there. And I'm, for whatever reason, He brought His wife and kids. He feels that it's okay to bring them back here now. You mm-hmm. know, it's not this cycle what we're walking around the woods. Out in the wilderness. <laughs> well, the, you know, the danger they likely, uh, Moses would have known he faced there in, in Egypt. You know, Pharaoh wanted to kill him. Right, All so you get rid of that. he was doing. He kept his family safe for a little while. Yep. And then there in verse 12, uh, the second half. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. I've read right over that before. It's just, you know, another little thing that they did. They did sacrifices. They bread, broke bread together. You know, kind of a symbolic thing. And I realized as I was uh, reading it for, for this morning, to eat bread, what, what bread did the Israelites have at this point? They had manna. Sourdough. Sourdough. <laughs> Rye bread. <laughs> like we, we actually know what kind of bread they had. They had manna that showed up every morning from God. This wasn't like they went out and there were just loaves of bread sitting on the doorstep. <laughs> they woke up every day and there was just bread out there. And they went and they picked it up. It's a pretty miraculous thing in and of itself. And here they are sharing that bread together uh, with Moses' father-in-law before God. And aside from just their eating bread that came directly from God, and that's a pretty cool thing in and of itself, I see it having a very uh, symbolic meaning as well. I mean, this is the bread of God that is given to the Israelites. And when a visitor comes and is sharing in their, uh, their worship of God, they share the bread of life that God has given to them with this person, purposefully. They didn't just, oh, well, I guess we need bread, let's, let's get some bread, but they purposed to sit down and share bread together. They shared the word of God with a visitor. I see that as being something that we certainly should be doing with visitors to our household as well. Not just, oh, let's sit together and chat and talk and maybe be happy about the things that God has done and play games and then move on. But they purpose to sit down and for us that, that bread, that word of God is is the word of God. They're sharing that with each other. Uh, with fellow believers when they entertain them as guests. And think about how different this, this whole interaction from when his father shows up and the way that they greet each other, the things that they talk about and the things that they do is different from the way we typically entertain guests in our own homes, particularly guests that we would know would be fellow believers. We don't really follow, I say we because I realize I don't most of the time either, follow this sort of prescription for, for communication and action with people we meet that we haven't been around. You get them? We haven't been around for a while. Normally, it's a lot of shallower stuff. We ask other families have been, we ask how work has been, and other things that are going on in their life and their health, and then maybe we eat together and play games, and we end up moving on. And here they, they purposed, yes, they shared these regular pleasantries of, of catching up and finding out how the family was doing. Then they shared what the Lord was doing in their lives. They rejoiced in it together, have their faith, on both sides, strengthened by the evidence of what God has done. They offer sacrifices to him, which certainly we don't do the same kind of sacrifices, but we have other things. We can sacrifice our time. We can sacrifice our lives. I mean, we can sit together and sing praises to the Lord. And in this case, they literally shared the bread of life with each other. How often do we do that? with fellow believers that we haven't seen that come into our homes? Do we sit and share the Word of God and the meaning it has had recently in our lives with each other, the impact that that has had? And yet here's that example that we're getting of how these two esteemable men of God 
meet and interact over this day. That's, I, I think that that's how God wants us to be, uh, you know, even as a church family. You know, we don't see each other for a week, and it's the easiest thing to do is just see each other and how you doing, you know, how's, how's the animals or how's the family, uh, how's work, and kind of kind of leave it at that. Like we touched base and, and we're good to go. We, it's more difficult because uh, it's it's so personal, perhaps, to really ask about what the Lord has been doing over the last couple of days or week or you know month or two that it is sometimes before we see somebody else again, and to rejoice in those things and then to share what God has been doing in our own lives and the evidence we've seen of His power and of His glory to build each other's faith up with these things. So in verse 13, we get to the next day, and again, Jethro would have, would have woken up in the morning and seen the manna uh, out there, and the quail the night before. You see all these miraculous things that God is continuing to do day by day for these people. And we get to see where Moses sat to judge the people and how he describes that to Jethro when Jethro asks about it down in, uh, in verse 15. Because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a difficulty, they come to me. And I judge between one and another. And I make known the statutes of God and his laws. This is a very direct picture of Moses fulfilling the role of Christ as the judge between the children of God and the lawgiver to the children of God. Now Moses isn't making the laws. Notice that. He makes known to the people the statutes and the laws of God and uses his wisdom and his understanding of them to judge between matters for the people. Small matters, great matters, all the matters. He sat from morning until evening doing this all day long, judging things for the people. The, the issues that they had. And these weren't <coughs> just like court cases that came up. I mean, you think about <coughs> things that go on in your own life that, I mean, as we often do here, you know, we have something come up that we, we feel is a spiritual matter or not even particularly, particularly a spiritual matter, but a family matter or a, a difficulty that we're having. We look for someone else with wisdom that we trust to go to. Pretty much all of us here all of us here, I don't even see pretty much, <laughs> have gone to Todd, particularly, with issues and asked him to help, to give advice and to judge the matters that we have going on, to be able to trust the advice and the direction that he would give us and then go and follow it. Now that these people are doing, they're bringing all the stuff that goes on in their lives to Moses because they go, here's a guy who talks to God, he's very wise and knows what God wants. So if he gives us advice, we're pretty sure that's going to be going to be good. So everybody goes to him. <laughs> and Moses is choosing to do this. He had he had a really good excuse that day. His father-in-law and his wife and his kids had just come back. He hadn't seen them for an extended period of time. Several months. He could have said, hold on people, I'm going to take a vacation day and spend the time with my father-in-law and my family. He didn't do that. He was dedicated to what he saw as his role that God had put him in to deal with these people and to help these people. Despite knowing how the people felt about him, it was very shortly before that, back in chapter 17, verse 4, Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. <laughs> these people didn't particularly like Moses when anything bad happened in their lives. Here he is willing to take his own time and sit and judge for them and help them with matters that were going on in their lives. He was a man who conversed with God like, like no one else. Literally, like no one else had done. In Numbers chapter 12, we see this, and this is the Lord. He came down and he spoke to Aaron and to Miriam when they had basically brought an accusation against Moses from the people, saying, hey, 
the Lord can talk to any of us, so why are you the one in charge? Why can't we be in charge of ourselves? Because we can hear directly from God. It was God's answer to them. And then he said, God said, Hear now my word. <coughs> there is a prophet among you. I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a dream. Or in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face, even plainly, but not in dark sayings. And he sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? <laughs> we don't have many examples of God coming down and, for more than maybe a time or two, speaking to a human being and giving him just plainly the direction that he wanted for that day. And yet with Moses, he did that for decades and gave him direction. This is the person that all the people got to go to for advice. I mean, we can see why there would be that, that desire to go to him. God, God talks to that guy. Like, he doesn't even talk to us at all. And he talks to Moses, the Lord, the one who did all those things back in Egypt and, and parted the Red Sea and makes food appear for us every day. Let's go to that guy for advice. And he did that. He chose to be a servant for everyone, despite having that closeness with God. He still didn't see himself as above everybody else, as too important to deal with the matters. He felt it was his responsibility to, to do that and to take care of them and to render judgments for them in all matters. And Jethro here sees what goes on and has some some words for him. What is it? There, I think there's there's something going on here that uh, Moses is doing this stuff not necessarily from God now. You know, I'm not. I don't think God has necessarily put him put wanted to put him in this role as a judge. You know, except for you know the nation or whatever. I mean, it's um, it just seems like there's something there that because uh, otherwise he wouldn't. It's kind of like a rebuke he's getting from Jethro. Why are you doing this mm -hmm. thing? This is you know God has set up this you know a, a kingdom where the, you know you got leaders and down the line, but yet you're taking all the responsibility on yourself. And so he's he's kind of overstepped what God wanted. God's got to rein him into hey, you mm -hmm. know I set you to bring the word of God to the people and teach them the statutes and stuff but it's for judging all of them that, you know, I didn't set you this that's more, and, and that's exactly right, and that's why I find this whole interaction it seems really basic where his father-in-law comes, gives him some advice, and so Moses makes some, you know, political changes to the, the command structure that was going on but there's so much more when you start thinking about it like that here's Moses, we just read how God himself said, I talk to Moses like I don't talk to anybody else I come down and talk to him face to face and tell him exactly what I mean, when I want him to do it, how I want him to do it. And yet, here is God in this story, using Moses' father-in-law to give Moses advice that would be in accordance with what God would actually want. It's not that God couldn't have showed up to him one morning and said, Hey Moses, here's a better plan for doing all this judgment stuff. You need to find other people and have them deal with all the small matters. He, he could have done that. I mean, he talked to him all the time. God did. Moses listened to him and did those things. But he, he goes through this as an example to us, that no matter the position that God puts us into, how elevated we may be, particularly in the eyes of other people, looking up to Moses, we can't feel like we are above correction. or above the ability to have someone else bring the word of God. We can't become what the, the Catholics look at the Pope as being. Whereas, like, God talks to the Pope. Nobody can correct the Pope. Whatever he says, that's word, and nobody dares to oppose him. Cause he's got all the answers because he talks to God. He doesn't, just to be clear, but they think he does. In this case, we know Moses did. And God's using that example to say, even though I talk to Moses, recognize how important he is and how how unique that relationship between God and Moses is, other people can come along and using the wisdom God has given them, have advice that is godly and should be implemented in what they're doing. 
and that they shouldn't get so proud as to reject any advice that somebody else would give them. And I think God purposely allowed Moses to get himself into this situation of feeling like he had to deal with every matter that was going on so that he could bring that correction through Jethro as an example for us in this case. And that's into why it happened. And Jethro proves himself to be a good servant of God, a good friend to Moses by choosing to speak up. You know, he may have been kind of cowed by, man, it's Moses, he's in charge of millions of people, he, he just talks to God all the time. I don't do that. I don't even know his name until I heard about all this stuff going on. His name's Jehovah. I knew. <laughs> he still realizes it's his role that God has put him in to give this man advice, to give him counsel. Well, he was not... He, there was not enough of Moses to go around either. I mean, yes, I well recognize that. Well, they're, <laughs> they're there from morning to night, and he's not answering all the disputes. Hmm? There I mean, if, you, if you're there every ten minutes, you got millions of people. There's still people out there, and so they're just disgruntled, and they're not getting help or taught or trained or rectified. And so that's looking against Moses. He didn't deal with us today, you know. And they're having so y there's a place where you can take on more responsibility than you can handle, mm -hmm. which not only puts a burden on you, it doesn't benefit the people you're trying to help because they no longer get good advice or sound because now you're tired, you just rush through stuff, you know, oh, just, we'll deal with it tomorrow. You're putting it off because you can't do it. So it's also a warning is to do what God has called you to do, but don't take on more of the burden than you're called to take on. Mm -hmm. You know, get yourself in a place where you can handle the responsibilities God's given you but don't pile on more because you think you're the only one that can do it. Well, I'm the only one smart enough to do this, so I'm going to take all this burden. God said, no, you train up the leaders so that they can do it, and then you'll judge the, the heavy stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, So you, as you make disciples, you can put them in charge of stuff, and if they get to a place where they don't understand something, then you come back and uh, he will correct that. So yeah. it's, a very, it's a warning to us not to get so absorbed in thinking we're doing God's work that we aren't doing it anymore because we can't. We just have put on to be a burden. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it's that's exactly right. It's also interesting, and we'll get into it a little bit later, to think about that, but from the other side. Not from the person in that position that needs to recognize they need to train other people up, but all the other people who may need to recognize, as Jethro does for Moses here, that, hey, you're actually trying to do too much and you need to let other people you need to, to get other people to step up and handle some of these things for you um, and so he gives he gives this advice to Moses that is not just I don't think just like purely rational oh it doesn't have anything to do with God here's just some some random advice that comes but you know as God said as, as iron sharpens iron so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend that's why I say that Jethro showed himself a true friend. He recognized something that Moses was trying to do that needed to be changed, and he chose to speak up and give him godly advice. He doesn't just say, do this. I mean, he says, he says twice in there, uh, here in verse 19, Listen now to my voice, I will give you counsel, and God will be with you. And then in verse 23, If you do this thing, and God so commands you, then you'll be able to endure it wasn't just, you need to do this thing, and then God will, God will bless you, but I'm going to give you advice, and God will be with you, and if, if God actually wants you to do this, then do it, and it'll work. And he, he epitomizes to me uh, 2 Timothy 3.15, where Paul is giving Timothy advice on how to be the shepherd that he was put in position to be by God and recognized by Paul and others. Uh, but in, in 2 Timothy 3.15 And that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. For all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And here I see Jethro using Scripture 
as correction for Moses. And I, I say scripture on purpose. As we look at what what is scripture? What does that mean to us when we say scripture? God's word. God's word. We we normally literally we have God's scripture right here that we can use. Jethro didn't, didn't pull out his Bible and say, Hey Moses, here's here's how God has, has given an example of how you should be handling this and you should do these things. But nonetheless it was scripture because scripture is God's word. God's word is whom? In particular, which person? Is is Jesus. You know, John John one one. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And a few verses later in 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The direction and the wisdom that, that God, that Jesus, the Holy Spirit, will give to us for our own lives, or as advice for other people, when it comes from God, we can call that scripture. Not so much as write it down and put it into the Bible and we need to add to it, but it's the wisdom of God. It's the words of Christ that he wants us to use for reproof, for doctrine, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness to, as Jethro does here for Moses, help him to do what God wanted him to do in, in the way he wanted him to do it. This is the, the vehicle that God chose to use for Moses to be able to, to fulfill God's plan. Again, he could have spoken directly to Moses. He decided to use this path, one, as a test for Moses, see how he would take correction, and two, as an example for us that no matter where we are, if we're the lower or we're the higher, that we need to be open to giving correction and to receiving correction from someone else is we judge it against the wisdom that God gives to us. And it's it's also interesting that in John chapter 1, in verse 17, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. I just found it interesting that Moses is mentioned in there in that section as the one who gave the law, who the law was given through. But that grace and truth come through Jesus Christ. Uh, For here, here Moses is making known to people God's statutes and his laws and judging between them in which way they should go in that matter. And in verse 19, Jethro says, I will give you counsel and God will be with you. And he gives Moses a different model for dealing with the troubles of the people than what he had been doing. And as he gives this advice, he lists what Moses should be doing and then he lists what he should be looking for and other people to have them help me. I want to write in my terrible handwriting. You have Moses, and there's certain jobs he's going to have. Then he has, let's just call them judges in this case. Other words we could use there would be overseers, elders, deacons. So the same people, different words that he's using here. And so we have what I saw there is four roles that Jethro uh, delineates for Moses to be doing, four particular jobs. What were those four particular jobs that he wanted Moses to do? How do you do that? You know? How do you make disciples? <laughs> that is what he's, he's given Moses instruction on, certainly. Well, he, he, ta- he called Moses to be a teacher foremost now instead of a judge foremost. To teach them the statutes so and the law. He, he becomes a teacher first. Mm-hmm. Well, he's still a judge. I would actually say that would be that would be the second of what he wants. His teaching, because can you just go out and teach people? Go teach people how to how to work on particle count. If God is telling me how to do it, to go tell him. <laughs> but, but, learn God. but that's the point. Is that first, you know, the, the first thing he says to him, um, verse 19, stand before God for the people so that you may bring the difficulties to God. You know, there's going to be things going on. The first thing, even as, as individuals, no matter 
who we are over, even if it's just ourselves, the first thing we have to do is come before God and say, look, I, I know I was a sinner, and I have difficulties. I'm going to have difficulties in my life. Well, <coughs> how do I deal with these things? Right, we already know he was the representative. I mean, because he's been walking with God and talking with God, that's why the people are coming to him. Mm-hmm. So that wasn't like... But, but despite that, part of his role is to still stand before God and find out what God wants him to do. Not just take it for granted that I've, I've got this stuff, I don't need to find out from God anymore. I've already got all the information. I'm just going to go out and do all kinds of stuff and help people. Jesus says, pick up your cross daily and follow him. So Every day. We yeah, still got to come to God. Moses still have to do that. But Moses was, was doing that. Yeah, I'm, I'm saying. God for it before he can teach it. Yeah, that's, that's the basics of it. Go before God and find out what he wants. And then go teach it to the people. Well, I, I'm just saying that Moses was doing that to the best of his ability. He just is getting now new. He wasn't trans. He wasn't going any further than Moses. You know, he's going and talking to God, and it's just he's not. He doesn't know how to delegate it or or teach it. Now it's he's yeah. in a new yeah. It's a new job um, description. Okay, mm-hmm. you know all this stuff. You talk with God every day. Now go put it to practice and tell these people how to do here's that. Here's a better way to get it to everybody than than just you going and telling everyone in person. So he's got millions of people following him. To judge all the things that are going to go on in all their lives, he can sit all day and he'll never get through it. You know, for ever. He just won't. <laughs> and you look at how many people we have in our church. We've got, I think I counted nine families in our church. And certain numbers. You've got about 30 people that generally make up our body here. And say that all of us try to go to Todd for every issue that comes up. He won't have time to properly deal with all those issues. Now multiply that 30 by, you know, 500,000, and it's just not going to happen. <laughs> and so what would be the third thing? Uh, so he goes to God, he stands before God, he teaches them the statutes and the laws, and then what?
it was so that other people would be able to look at Moses and his family as, well, how do we deal with our own family? He could show them how to walk each day and, and the work that they should be doing in their own families even because the great guy that talks to God has his own family. And I don't assume that he never had a problem with his family. He had to deal with them for another 40 years. So walk us through there. Yeah, I like your version, Alex, where he sent her off to protect, where Carrie and she sent her well, off to the mad. <laughs> <laughs> I need a break. <laughs> it, it doesn't say that Moses sent for his wife and kids to come back. Jesse brought him back and said, right. I'm, I'm, bringing, I'm bringing back your wife and kids and you sent away. You need to deal with this in order to continue that. Mm -hmm. So there was, and it doesn't, it doesn't tell us, you know, what the issues were, how it resolved, whatever. But we do know that God sent them back, and Moses had to deal with that, and then stand before God and start teaching them ways to walk and work to do. Mm -hmm. So we we do understand that. We just can't assume why he sent them and why they came back. We just know that God said, now you... This is what this happened. This is what happened. They came this, back at yeah, this time. And now you're going to start walking and teaching and doing. Because mm -hmm. if he was sitting and taking care of everybody else's problems all day, he wouldn't have any time for his own family, even. And can't regard your priorities. Mm -hmm. You've got to recognize what those are. It's got to start for yourself, your family, and then branches out from there. And I, I certainly see in the evidence that going forward... Moses was taking care of his family because God continued to have him in that position of taking care of the rest of the nation for the next four decades. And then he says, verse 21, Moreover, you shall select from all the people, other people who would, the way he words here, be judges over the people for them. And he gives, again, four characteristics for those people that he should pick. What were those four characteristics? Fear God. What? Fear God. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did you be able then? The second one was fear of God. They had to fear God. And the truth. And consciousness. That hated, yeah, hated <laughs> coming. <laughs>
there's not just a person at the top and then everybody following that person and always going to that person for everything that they need because they're a holy person and they know God and they know the Bible and we can always get a good answer from them that we like. So he desires there to be uh, a level of hierarchy, not a level of, of importance, like somebody is, is better than somebody else, but that God has built them into someone who can deal with things. Um, for every group, really, that would desire to follow God and desire to honor Him. And it starts in our own families. I mean, we don't just have, I'll take my family for example, everything that happens in my family, I don't have to judge. My wife is trained and is wise, and I have judged her able to take care of those kids while I'm at work, while I'm helping other people, while I'm doing other things. She doesn't have to call me every time there's a problem with the kids and say, what should I do? What should I do? He's crying. He's complaining. He got hurt. What do I do in these situations? She can take care of those things. (laughs) A lot of times, (laughs) that's what's needed. (laughs) But that's the same model that God has has given to Moses here, just implemented on a smaller scale, but in the same way. I'm in that position Moses was in, and I have chosen a wife who would be able to take that position of one of the judges. Obviously, not a man, but (laughs) she's able. She knows truth. She fears God. She hates covetousness. So she's able to judge for other people the way that I would confer that ability onto her. Well, sometimes things come up and she's like, I, they won't listen to me or I'm not sure what to do in this case and she does bring those things to me and I work with that just as they had here for Moses. And that goes into even the smallest setting. You know, if you have one kid, it still applies. Up to the largest setting of millions of people. And it applies in, in the church, certainly. I I looked through Acts and saw it a number of times in Acts. Uh, It's very explicitly in Acts chapter 6, where the the disciples, they had 12 of them again, when they replaced Judas with Matthias. And they were dealing with things, and there came up a dispute amongst the Hellenists of the daily distribution, as they were all a big group sharing all the stuff they had. And they were saying they didn't get enough of their own stuff. And the disciples certainly, apostles, certainly could have gone and dealt with that and made sure everything was going exactly the way it needs to go. But what they did instead was they picked seven men to take care of that for them. <coughs> for a particular reason, not just uh, I don't want to be bothered by that. But uh, here in Acts chapter 6 verse 2, then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. In saying, please the multitude, they picked a certain number of men who they set before them. They judged them worthy to do that, laid hands and prayed, and sent those people out to do that work so that they could dedicate themselves to prayer and the work of the ministry. The same thing, just in different words, as to what Moses' role was, was to stand before God and to teach. We pray, we speak with God, we learn from Him, and we teach the people directly under us. And then that can continue to step down as they are sent out to judge and to deal with other problems. And then we get to uh, other, other places further on in Acts. We see it continuing to be the model. Issues would come up, and uh, the issue would then go to Jerusalem and come before the council that was there. They would render a decision. The decision would be sent out and be followed by everybody else. Not everything came to them to be dealt with. And I see this applying to our church at this time. It's very typical for for all of us, myself included, to take everything that comes up and go, man, I wonder what I should do, or what what does this mean, or what would be the correct response in the situation, and to go, you know what, Todd is a really wise man. He's really smart. He's able to understand the scriptures and give comprehensive advice 
from those scriptures to me. We go to him for that advice. Varying degrees. Because we know that God has given him this, this ability to astutely understand the word and to give a thorough, if, if not succinct, but a thorough uh, answer for, for the troubles, as, as he calls it here in Exodus 18, for what's going on. And for a time, that, that, that works, because there's only so many people, so many problems, and he can handle all that. I see the lesson that God has given, particularly to us here, is that we can't continue to do that. We have to recognize that, and I believe Todd has recognized this, and hence he has worked to appoint elders and to appoint deacons, that he is not going to be able to, as Moses wasn't going to be able to, continue to handle all the matters that come up all the time. He will get burnt out. Other people will get burnt out because we spending time with that family is not spending time with our family as much. They must be more important, or their issues are more important than ours. There'll be resentment. There'll be more trouble that that brings up. And that what God wants, is why I said look at it from the other perspective, it's not always that person at the top going, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to be able to handle all these people. I need to appoint other people. Tom's been working at that. But it also is, is our responsibility as the other people to recognize this structure, that not everything has to go to our pastor to be dealt with. That there are going to be other judges who fulfill these requirements and are put in those roles. And there's several other lists we can go to as to how we judge who should be in those positions. Uh, there's quite a few in the New Testament. I'm not going to go over all of them, but... <coughs> on what those people are going to look like and that those people that get put into the elder position or put in position as a deacon are going to be these people that are put over thousands and hundreds and fifties and tens to judge all the matters that they can, all the smaller matters, instead of taking every matter up to the top. Or in our case, taking every matter to Todd. That we have to purposely seek out the other people that are put in positions of, of authority in our church and bring matters to them and see if we get a resolution there. And then if we don't, we as the elders would bring that issue up to our pastor and have it dealt with, just as they would with Moses. They judge all the smaller matters. For every great matter, they'll bring up to Moses. We can bring those up to our pastor to prevent the very thing that, that Jethro was recognizing here. That, you know, as he said, uh, the thing that you do is not good. He wasn't saying that being a judge for the people is not good. It was a good thing to do, but Moses is overreaching and overextending himself, despite the, the great stamina that the Lord had given to him. We see 40 years later, uh, after he's done leading the children of Israel for four decades, one of the things God says about him is his natural vigor and stamina were not reduced. God had kept him in great physical shape and ability that whole time. He's 80 years old at this point. And he's able to sit all day long and judge <coughs> the people. <coughs> he was able, when they fought the Amalekites, they're in, verse, uh, in chapter 17, in verse 11, when Moses held up his hands, that the Israelites were prevailing, when he let him down, Amalek prevailed. In verse 12, Moses' hands became heavy. He's holding up the rod. For how long? We don't know. It was probably a pretty long battle. I don't know if you've ever tried to just hold up your arms and just see how long you can hold them up. You should do it maybe sometime when you're at home and you're just you know sitting doing something else, watching TV or whatever. Just put up your arms, don't even put anything in them, and just see how long you can hold them up. They get really heavy pretty quickly, actually, and you've got to put them back down. <laughs> Here he was trying to do that all day long, at 80 years old. I don't know many 80-year-olds that could just hold up their arms all day long. But there's a picture in there that even as his arms became heavy, trying to, to do the responsibility that was given to him, he didn't hand that responsibility off to somebody else. He didn't say, because uh, he, had, he, had, he, had, he had Aaron and Hur with him, one on one side and one on the other. Joshua was leading the army. Mm -hmm. Caleb isn't mentioned yet. Sure. They didn't, he didn't just hand the staff off and say, here, you take this mantle of leadership and this responsibility that God's given me and you take care of it for a while. None of us as the elders are sitting in the place of Todd as our pastor that God has put there. We are simply handling matters 
so that he can continue to do what God has given him to do and not get burned out on it. But they supported his arms, Aaron and her, one on each side. They held up Moses' arms instead of taking the staff from him. They're, we have to recognize that God sets up uh, structure on purpose. It doesn't just happen that way or we figure out a way for it to work. God has designed certain people to do certain jobs for certain periods of time during life. That's the way God wants it to be. And whether we think it's good or not, if that's what we recognize God is saying it should be, that's what we got to do, very clearly. In Ephesians chapter 4, we always get to Ephesians, don't we, Carrie? Yeah. <laughs> Starting in verse 11. And he himself, God himself, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Clearly, we recognize in this that he gives different people different jobs. Not everybody is going to be... Moses. There was, there was one Moses for the time that he was there. Now God clearly sets up structure under Moses here in this part and further on when he institutes Aaron as the high priest and Aaron's family as the priests and the Levites as a support for them. Where Aaron didn't have to do everything. Moses didn't have to do everything. But Moses was still at that top position where God had put him. Uh, and continuing there in, in Ephesians, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. We're a, we're a body. You know, not everybody is called to be the pastor right now. As, as life goes on and God continues to mature each of us, there may be a time when he calls each of the men in this room to be a pastor at some point, some place. We don't know. But right now, he's given all of us roles to fulfill. We have to first recognize what those roles are. We have to be okay with those roles because God because God has created us as a body each body part has different functions we can't all be the head as he says because then where would the walking be we can't all be feet because then would, where would the seeing be we can't all do the same job but we support each other as a group as a, as a family so that we can do the work that God wants us to do equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry edifying of the body of Christ each part does its own share if we do the work that God delineates for each of us to do. can't make up our own way for all that to work, or our own way for us to obey. Pharaoh tried that when he was dealing with Moses and hence with Jehovah uh, in letting the children of Israel go. As the plagues kept going on, he got to the point where he said, okay, okay, you guys, you can go out and you can worship your God out there. But just the men, just the able-bodied men, everybody else, the animals, the little kids, the women, they got to stay here. Just the men. He tried to obey in his own way. Didn't work. More plagues. <laughs> anyway, okay, okay. All the people can go, but you got to leave your stuff and your animals. All the rest of you can go. Still trying to make his own way to obey God. Still didn't work. More plagues. People end up dying. We have to find out what God wants and then do that. He was destroyed after time because his desire was not to honor God, to fulfill the desire of God. We as, as God's people, the ones that should be spreading the word of God to others, like what drew Jethro there to Moses to find out what would be going on, we ought to be looking to know individually we have to stand before God. We have to be taught and we have to go and work and, and abide in Christ to do the work that God gives to us individually and as a group. Otherwise, the body will not work. 
And that's, to me, that's the essence of this, this lesson that Jethro gives to Moses, is that you can't be the only person that's in charge. And to everybody else, you can't all be looking to the same person for that leadership. At the top, yes. But you have to be able to go to other people for that. For that direction and, and judgment that God will, will hand out in things. And Moses then was not above accepting criticism of how he was handling things. If anybody was in a position to say, oh no, I got this, God will tell me if it needs to change, it would be Moses. Like, I'll just go talk to him tonight, find out what he wants. He considered this that Jethro delivered to him and ended up implementing it. And you showed real wisdom in being able to do that. Those uh, are not so wise as they would like themselves to be thought, who think themselves so wise that they can't be corrected, that they can't accept advice, that they can't have someone else come and give them direction from God to correct them, to instruct them, to help them understand something that should be going on differently. And uh, he was the, the quintessential example of what is said in Second Peter chapter 5. Verse 5. Nope, not Second Peter, 5, 5. First Peter. So there is no Second Peter, 5, 5. First Peter, 5, 5. <laughs> Likewise, you longer, younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. We have to recognize that no, no man is an island, as the saying goes, and is above being able to be given direction through another person. Even Moses wasn't above God purposing to set things up to where Jethro would be the one to give him the godly way to do something that Moses was doing a bit incorrectly at this time. And so Moses listened to the advice given to him. He implemented that plan. We can see in Deuteronomy chapter 1. Moses is speaking to Israel before they go into the, the promised land. And in Deuteronomy 1.9, this is Moses here saying, And I spoke to you, to the people, at that time, saying, I alone am not able to bear you, the Lord your God has multiplied you, and here you are today as the stars of heaven in multitude. May the Lord God of your fathers make you a thousand times more numerous than you are, and bless you as he has promised you. How can I alone bear your problems and your burdens and your complaints? Choose wise, understanding, and knowledgeable men from among your tribes, and I will make them heads over you. And you answered me and said, The thing which you have told us to do is good. So I took the heads of your tribes, wise and knowledgeable men, and made them heads over you, leaders of thousands, leaders of hundreds, leaders of fifties, leaders of tens, and officers for your tribes. Then I commanded your judges at that time, saying, Hear the cases between your brethren, and judge righteously between a man and his brother, or the stranger who is with him. You shall not show partiality in judgment. You shall hear the small as well as the great. You shall not be afraid in any man's presence, for the judgment is God. The case that is too hard for you, bring it to me, and I will hear it. And I commanded you at that time all the things which you should do. Exactly the way that Jethro instructed him, you should do it. Find these wise and knowledgeable men who feared God and loved truth and set them over the people. He then taught those men, and those men went and taught other people. Not by making up their own things, but as he said there, don't be afraid of the judgments that you give. Because if you give godly judgment, it's just saying... Here's, here's what God says about it, and here's what you should do. It's not about me coming up with a way that you're going to handle it, but here's the godly way to do it. And you don't worry about somebody getting mad at you. They're really getting mad at God because you're giving them godly advice. Maybe he does that in the next chapter. We'll read. I mean, it's when he sets it up. It's, it's good to see that he goes back and reinforces it and, and builds on that in Deuteronomy. You know, he talks mm -hmm. about it. I did this, and this is how we did it, and it's worked, and you're getting bigger, and it works. just yeah, reinforces what he did in the next chapter. So he did, it's not like 
why he put it out till Deuteronomy late, way down the road. He did it like the next day. Oh yeah, that's just a description of him saying. This is what we back did. then. Here's yeah. what I said. Yep. This is how it worked. And that's you know for each of us in our own lives, we have to pay attention to coming to God and finding out what's the role you have put me in right now, Lord. I'm a father. I'm a husband. He put me also into a position as an elder in the church. There's certain responsibilities that come along with that. Right now, that's where I am. It doesn't mean I'll be in this position in a year. Hopefully still be a husband and a father, but I, I may not be here. Who knows? But I have to individually make sure I'm doing the role that God has put me in. And then as families, that we are operating correctly and being a proper example to anybody that might see us. And then corporately, as, as a church, that we're acting in accordance with, primarily, first at least, the clear directions that God gives to us as to what the structure here is supposed to look like. Not, we're just going to be a club, we're all going to get together and have parties and, and be happy and say, yay God. He's told us certain ways everything's supposed to happen and how we're supposed to deal with these problems. For the purpose of, as, as Jethro said there in verse 23, if you do this thing and God so commands you, then you will be able to endure and all this people also go to their place in peace. That was the goal of it. Not just to find a better way to handle it. <coughs> that everyone will be able to endure with the work God gives them. He knows how much work to give each of us. And that we will be able to go, as we go from here this morning, back to our own place in peace. Not, not in trouble, not with hatred or, or being disgruntled about something that's going on. But that those issues will be dealt with in the structure that God has designed. And we'll be able to have peace. That's what people want so much. They just want peace. They want harmony. And God tells us how to go and get that. We don't get to make up our own way to go and find peace. But that's what he wants.